All right. Thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate Laughing to Keep from Dying, African-American satire in the 21st century. My name is Heather, and I'm the publicity manager at the University of Illinois Press, and I'm just going to go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much to Dr. Morgan and W. Kamal Bell for being here today. They're going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we will have time for a 20-minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'd also like to thank the Collective Oakland for partnering with us on this event. I'll put a link to their website where you can purchase the book in the chat box. Please support them. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. Watch our social media for an announcement. And now I will just briefly introduce our guests. Dr. Danielle Morgan is an assistant professor in the Department of English at Santa Clara University, who specializes in African-American literature and culture in the 20th and 21st centuries. She is interested in the ways that literature, popular culture, and human humor shape identity formation. In particular, her research and teaching reflect her interests in African-American satire and comedy, literature and the arts as activism, and the continuing influence of history on contemporary articulations of Black selfhood. She has written a variety of both scholarly and popular articles and has been interviewed on topics as varied as Black Lives Matter, the dangers of the Karen figure, race and sexuality on the Broadway stage, and Beyonce. Her book, Laughing to Keep from Dying, African-American Satire in the 21st Century, is published by the University of Illinois Press. W. Kamau Bell is a stand-up comedian and the host and executive producer of the Emmy award-winning CNN docuseries, United Shades of America with W. Kamau Bell. His latest stand-up comedy special, Private School Negro, is available on Netflix. Kamal wrote a book with the easy to remember title, The Awkward Thoughts of W. Kamal Bell, tales of 6'4", African-American, heterosexual, cisgender, left-leaning, asthmatic, black and proud blurred, mama's boy, dad, and stand-up comedian. He's the ACLU Celebrity Ambassador for Racial Justice and serves on the advisory boards of Hollaback and Donors Choose. And now without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Morgan and Kamal. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. Hello. Hi, Danielle. Hey, it's good to see you. <laughs> it's, it's good to see you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a while. It has. I feel like last time we saw each other, we made some sort of like, before the year's over, we're going to get our families together and hang out. And then it was like, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> see you. Never, I guess. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, 2020 had different ideas for all of yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, congratulations on your book. Thanks. Right here, I got it. Uh, how's it How's it feel to uh, birth a book? Um, it feels It feels great. I feel like I've been working on this uh, for a really long time, and it's it feels um, it feels really exciting to have it in people's hands and to kind of get people's thoughts and continue the conversation about all of this. Yeah, I, I, I grew up as a fan of comedy uh, before I became a comedian and sort of scouring the comedy uh, shelves of bookstores before there was a thing called the internet, just sort of like stumbling upon books uh, about specifically about comedy, but also about black comedy. And of course, there were not that many. There was a couple uh, with Mel Watkins, uh, uh, was it Donald Bogle? Donald Bogle. Uh, and so like, but like, it is, I have to say, it's pretty cool to not only that there's a new book for uh, young black comedy nerds to read, but also my name is in it a couple times, which I feel like it's like, for me personally, that's, it's like to imagine me reading those books back then and finding one day that my name would be in one of those books is pretty cool. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you for all of your, for all of the conversations we, we got to have um, in reference to the book and just kind of talking shop in general about comedy. Um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you noticed that. I didn't want to kind of text you and be like, hey, by the way, turn to page <laughs> 79 and you'll see something. But, but yeah, so good. So you read it. I, I can tell now that you for real actually read it. So yes. <laughs> uh, no, I absolutely, I mean, that's the great thing about it. I would have read it if I was, uh, like when I was 14, <laughs> you know, like, and it's also great to read it now that I'm 34. Uh, yeah. So, um, that's a joke, everybody. I'm not 34. So this, there will be jokes, but what is your, like, you know, the, the, the thing about the book I want to say to everybody who's on the, who's on the zoom is that it's an act, it's a book written by a person who is an academic, 
And it is an academic study of comedy, but not in a way that feels like you're eating your vegetables. So I just want to say that's a, for people who are like, I like comedy. It's not a, I don't, I don't want people to get the impression that it is, that sometimes academia, as you may have heard about, can make things a little bit like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, but it's actually, you feel your love of comedy in it. So good for that. Thank you. Thank you. Was that important to you when you wrote the book to sort of like make sure it was clear that you had a passion behind it? That, that people, that people could feel your passion. Yeah, I mean, so so for me, one of the cool things about, and one of the reasons that I wanted to study comedy in general is just, I feel like in academia, there is often this kind of impulse where we're told, you know, you shouldn't, you're, you're supposed to be very impartial, that your work matters because you are disconnected from it. And I just can't do that. And part of my sort of black feminist impulse is allowing myself to acknowledge when I enjoy something, when I find something um, happy, when, when I, you know, when something makes me happy, when something sort of uh, elicits an emotional response from me. And so for comedy, uh, the challenge and the joy of writing about comedy is really thinking about the fact that comedy itself elicits this joyful response and then thinking about why that is. So, so I felt like to write this book, I had to be honest with myself that I'm a comedy fan. I love comedy. It matters to me both professionally and as a human being. Um, I've, I've, you know, I, I, one of the things that kind of inspired this book was um, my relationship with my uncle Kevin, who the book, I, uh, the book is dedicated to my uncle Kevin, who passed away in 1997 and to my mom, uh, because my uncle Kevin, you know, loved comedy so much. He really taught me about comedy. I got to watch these, you know, um, sketch shows with him and sort of talk shop in that kind of way with him. And it, it became such this kind of critical piece of my life that there was no way to talk about it without acknowledging that reality as well. So, so yeah, I'm, I think that for a lot of us who write about comedy, there is that, that impulse to talk about it as a thing that we love, because why, why write about comedy if it's not, you know? Yeah. So talk about some of those, what are your, when you, you know, I, listening to WTF, as I'm sure you, <laughs> you, you have, Merritt always says, the, like, who are the, what are those tent poles that you, that as a kid that you were like, oh, this, this resonates with me? Sure. Um, so Eddie Murphy uh, is probably the comedian who had the biggest impact on, on my life. Um, I, I, I remember my uncle Kevin and uh, me walking to Blockbuster video back when that was a thing for all the young people out there. It was a place where you could go and rent videos and I would rent, you know, games for my Sega Genesis, which is a whole other conversation. But we would rent these um, like best of Eddie Murphy on SNL videos and we would watch them together and he would always like tell me to close my eyes and he would fast forward like anything he thought was a little too risque for me at age you know nine or ten or however old but we would watch these together and I remember thinking about how Eddie Murphy not only was he funny but there was something about him that was so compelling like you just couldn't take your eyes off of this guy like he was just when you saw him when he was young when you saw him when he was you know in coming to America or trading places and all of these things that he just seemed so charming and it was this idea to me that that comedy opened up this way not only for you to kind of talk about yourself but for other people to see you as well that it was because Eddie was so good at comedy we couldn't take our eyes off of him, but also because we couldn't take our eyes off of him, that made him an even better comedian. Um, so I think I think thinking about Eddie Murphy and what he was doing um, was really, really foundational for me. Um, and even outside of the realm of African American comedy, watching the Dick Van Dyke show, uh, which is one of my all time favorite shows about you know Dick Van Dyke playing um, uh, you know this character who is actually a comedy show writer and thinking about that sort of behind the scenes um, framework where suddenly you know at a very young age, I became aware of the fact that you all as comedians work really hard. <laughs> like, it's not just like you get up there and I mean, you know, you may be naturally funny and all of those kinds of things, but you're tailoring these jokes to kind of get this sort of response from us or to, um, 
reveal some sort of truth about the world around us. And that was something that I began paying attention to really, really young. And for that reason, you know, the whole, the book is kind of rooted around the idea that we can't just think of comedy as this thing that oops and happens, that people aren't just getting up on stage and sort of oops and making a, you know, making a funny joke and then moving on, that there's intention behind it. Um, Dave Chappelle is somebody I think, um, especially when we think about um, Dave Chappelle in his earlier uh, stand-up comedy routines, the fact that he, you know, has this sort of slacker persona, but he's super smart. He's obviously very calculated. And the older Dave Chappelle gets, the, um, the more he sort of pulls that curtain to the side and says, look, I'm actually thinking about these things. I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a message. Whether we agree with the message or not, he's got an intention behind it. And so all of those kind of work together to make me think about why this is, this is more than just sort of laughter, that there's an actual impetus behind all of this. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the title, Laugh, Laughing to Keep from Dying. I'm holding it up because it's like we're on a talk show or on a real talk show. Uh, so people go out, go support the collective, get this book from the collective in Oakland. Uh, I think that the link will be somewhere in your internets. Uh, go to the collective in Oakland, buy this book. They will send it to you, Laughing to Keep from Dying. This title seems so, you had, I'm sure you had no idea that when you picked this title, that, that 2020 would be like, that's the book we need. Um, but talk about the title outside of the context of 2020 and talk about how it's taken on your residence now. Sure. So when I, when I first started um, thinking about what to call this book, I kept thinking of Langston Hughes and this idea of laughing to keep from crying and the way um, we sort of, as African Americans, have had to utilize laughter as a um, palliative move, right, to, to sort of create the space um, for joy in the midst of unspeakable trauma. What I started thinking about within the context of the 21st century, and especially, you know, this book really took form. Uh, I started writing the book at the end of Obama's presidency, but it really, the, the sort of bulk of this work took place under Trump. Um, and so this question of death uh, was resonating all around me. Um, and not just sort of the, the physical deaths that we, you know, were watching out in the street, um, you know, certainly with, with COVID uh, as, as just one more way to die, but, you know, with um, police brutality and all of these other kinds of uh, ways that violence is enacted against Black bodies um, and Black people. Uh, but I also started thinking about the way there is this sort of spiritual death this kind of psychic death, the way that death takes all of these different forms when you are being denied your personhood, when you are not allowed to sort of be who you are, be who you say you are, that, that there is an idea of what you are supposed to be, um, how that limits your means of survival. And so I started really thinking about the fact that a lot of these comedians are using laughter as a way to sort of subversively get their message across and to re-articulate their own identity. We see this a lot in sketch comedy. We see this a lot also in the way these comedians now, especially in um, 2016 and beyond, I'm noticing a lot of comedians kind of negotiating this line between things that are overtly funny and things that are funny, but also bring you back and make you cringe and think about how horrible the reality of that is. One of the first quotes I have in the, um, in the book is from Chappelle's show where he's playing uh, a character called Clifton the Colored Milkman. Um, <laughs> and you know, he's, he's laughing and then he, as he's laughing, he says, ooh we all are, this racism is killing me inside. Um, and it's this, and, and that for me, I was like, that's it. It's that, that kind of moment that we're seeing over and over again. I'm laughing, but if I don't laugh, I will absolutely die. Um, it will be too much if I cannot make a joke about this thing. Well, you know, I, when you're writing a book about comedy, you, you may be familiar with this uh, concept that comedi comedians are notoriously thin-skinned <laughs> about our work and 
pretty much just want to be told that we're great or keep it moving. You know, we're fine if we if you don't laugh, but don't don't talk about why you didn't laugh or don't explain it to us. <laughs> if you don't write books about it, you know, like so. Is it hard to be a fan and then also come in as the as the as the academic who's like, let me pull this apart and really see what parts about this, you know, that are troubling or that are or that that I have fi that I find less joy in. Absolutely, and that that is a continual struggle for me um, because I love comedy, I love satire, and as a result, you know, in most cases, I really love the people who are doing that work. I can't do that work, so I, you know, I I really love the people who are who are doing that kind of work. Um, but one of the things I started thinking about is. Um, that I can be critical as long as I am writing for, from a place of love, where it's not sort of just writing people off and saying, you've done this you know, terrible thing and now I no longer trust you or I no longer want to um, watch what, you're, you know, what you've created or any of those things, but thinking about, okay, because I love this material, I want it to be as, as strong as possible. I want to um, think about the ways we can continue to utilize comedy the way it has been historically utilized in Black communities. Um, I also know that Chris Rock has talked about the fact that he um, felt that when he got a lot of pushback in the 90s for talking about hip-hop, he said, I always felt like I was allowed to criticize hip-hop because I loved hip-hop. And when I heard Chris Rock say that, I was like, please, Chris Rock, I hope you feel the same way. <laughs> because I love you, but like, I got to go there. You know, I got to make the kind of statement and that, that move to say, okay, you are brilliant, but that doesn't mean that you're infallible. And so let's talk about the ways that, that the comedy can keep doing what I think you want it to do, what you've said you want it to do. So writing from a place of love, which again goes back to the, the um, my sort of willingness to acknowledge, you know, I am a fan of the comedy. I, I love um, what comedians are doing, but I also want to hold people accountable. That's kind of part of my, my interest is that sense of accountability within comedy as well. So there's sort of two different ways to think about this. I remember seeing John Oliver, uh, not, hearing John Oliver when he f first got the, uh, his HBO show and talking to Terry Gross. And she was like, how do you, you know, you know, he had done some joke about some celebrity and Terry Gross was like, well, what happens if you run into that person? He's like, I hope I never run into that person. <laughs> he, you know, he's like, I, I don't even, I hope I, he's like, I don't go to those parties. I don't hang out in those places. So there's this idea of like, I want to stay away so I can keep my voice. But then there's the idea of like, basically, do you, in your fantasy, does, does do Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, and other comedians pick this up and read it? Or do you just feel like, I just wrote this book, don't, don't worry about it, just keep doing you, <laughs> you know, like. Oh, that's such a good question. I was joking with one of my friends the other day who was like, you know, the, the bigger this book gets, like the more there's a possibility that, um, you know, like Dave Chappelle picks this book up and flips through. And I was like, I kind of hope he doesn't, you know, like I'm not sure that I'm prepared for, I don't want Dave to make a joke about me on stage or, you know, anything like that. But um, at the same time, the book is, is out there, um, you know, to quote the, the you know, great philosopher Nene Leakes, I said what I said, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that people will take it from the place of love. I, I hope in the book, I've been very clear that it's not sort of a, um, it's not my opportunity to rag on anybody. It's my opportunity to say, you know, this is, this is the, this is the way the work is being received. And this is, why um, this is why it's important for us to think critically. I would also say probably that you know a lot of the the critiques I raise are specific to the pushback comedians have already received. So you know Chris Rock shouldn't be surprised necessarily that I talk about the inward versus black people set that he does because he's he knows people are have had complaints and he's talked about, you know, the way it failed um, to his mind in retrospect and things like that. And so hopefully they can, they would, if they, you know, read this, that they would see it as this um, space of, okay, she's not just sort of pointing out things and making us fodder for um, critique. She's actually taking these spaces 
where we've already been criticized and saying, here's what went wrong, here's why it went wrong, and here are some possible ways of thinking differently about yeah. the material. I always had sort of like when people ask me about comedy and like the idea of offending people or, or the idea of jokes that you did in the past. I feel like I've always sort of said all comedy dies on the vine. Like it doesn't, very little comedy sort of lasts th through generations. I think the only example I've ever really come up with is who's on first. Yeah. Like you can say that for a, a child. They'd be like, I get it. The names are, <laughs> you know, like I mean, but for the most part, especially and especially comedy that is about the moment that is specifically trying to talk about the you know politics or things that are topical i always said like if you listen to a lenny bruce album it's kind of like listening to calculus because you don't know the pop culture references you don't know his you don't know sort of like this where was the media coming from that he's coming at again you know all these different things and also so much of the things he did that were like that he got arrested for people have done things that are way outside of that. Th so it doesn't sound as revolutionary. Yeah. Exactly. People have done things way, you could do that tonight on stage. Nobody would care other than the fact you're not, you shouldn't be on stage because of COVID. But uh, <laughs> what is your, the, and so I think something like thinking like, cause I'm thinking about that. Like as I, you know, you referenced the book, the documentary I did culture shock about Chris Rock. And some of that I've always aware about like in that moment in time, that bit niggers versus black people was basically about that moment in time. But if you but if you look back now, it just it can't help but feel like ooh, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean it's 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 interesting. Whenever I teach my comedy course and we talk about Richard Pryor, for example, my students are like, "Oh, he's funny," <laughs> and that's kind of their their big takeaway. And they're like, "Yeah, I've seen things." like this or you know I've heard this joke before and I'm like but you heard it because somebody was imitating him and like it's hard to you can't sort of recapture the moment or the context even if it's something positive you know and so when we talk about um offense and the way things are read 10 20 30 years later you know that's all part of it which is why I really wanted to focus especially on the 21st century because it feels like there's still so much that's in play right now. Like we can look back at some of the comedy of the 80s um, and 90s. I mean, even, you know, with, with Eddie Murphy thinking about his stand-up and how, um, how hilarious parts of it are, but how grotesque and offensive and sort of um, inexcusable so much of what he says is. Um, and then the fact that Eddie Murphy himself has gone back as, you know, as a, you know, middle-aged man now saying, you know what, I do apologize for that. I was way too young. I was not thinking critically, all of these kinds of things. Um, yeah, it's just sort of the, the interesting way comedy evolves with the society in which it exists, that certain jokes are um, that, that we have a different kinds of context for how we're supposed to understand comedy and what, what inspires in us laughter that we feel okay with, you know, that you might still watch certain um, comedy from the past and laugh, but it's more of the sort of almost the church giggles of like, I shouldn't be laughing at this thing. Whereas a lot of what's going on in the 21st century, I think some comedians at least are really trying to inspire a laughter that, that is really thinking critically about this 21st century context. Yeah, I mean, I think, do you, do you think that the audience, because a lot of, you know, this, I think the, re the reports of cat cancel culture have been greatly exaggerated, I would say, generally. But there is sometimes, as a comedian, I feel like when I see people get, like, sort of excited or get angry about a thing, I'm like, you could probably just let that one go. <laughs> like, you could, like, you could, you could, that, like, I remember my parents sitting and watching, actually, Chris Rock, my dad and my stepmom watching Chris Rock, some special from, like, back in the day. And it was like, they would laugh where they wanted to. And when it got sort of a little bit too far, they would just sort of get quiet. Right. They would laugh, you know what I mean? Like, they were just sort of like, they were just like, nope, like, I'm gonna let this one go past. This is not for me. What do you think about the audiences? And I'm not here to say that, there's, there's, I certainly understand people wanting to have their voices heard about specific, like this bit is, is a part of a bigger discussion that we haven't had. But I think sometimes I feel like you could, that the tension of like, you don't have to get up, you don't have to sort of get up in arms about all of them. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of, um, a lot of cancel culture is absolutely imaginary. Um, I do not think that most people have been canceled to an extent that they haven't come back. Um, and that they haven't found 
you know, fans, even new fans who are, you know, liking them in spite of cancel, you know, whatever the, the sort of idea behind that might be. I think that that for me, a lot of what merits critique is when it ultimately does harm to marginalized groups or to people who don't have enough voice. Um, and so it, it really becomes that question of punching up. Are you making a joke about people who have tons of power, who are really um, allowed to articulate themselves for themselves, who are able to really sort of um, think critically about why this joke matters or doesn't? Or are you just sort of, you know, like ragging on somebody who doesn't have any power, who you obviously have um, the ability to create, um, you know, to, to enact harm against, even if you're making a joke. I think it's why um, one thing that I really will not abide is, you know, jokes about trans people. Um, for example, that that is just that is just overtly punching down on a group that experiences literal violence. Like we're talking about, you know, psychic and mental violence and all of those things, but physical death is mm -hmm. possible because those kinds of jokes become um, people's. You know, people want to utilize those jokes as the justification for for doing horrible things. And so, uh, for me there's a difference in like, uh, this joke is just kind of offensive or it's kind of, you know, problematic and jokes that really enact harm. And there's enough jokes, quite frankly, that are enacting harm that we can really focus on those primarily and, and give a little bit of wiggle room to the things where it's like, uh, that just wasn't very funny to me or, you know, that, that joke seemed a little off or a little off color or they were trying something that didn't work. Um, focusing our energy on where um, there's actual harm being uh, created, I think is, is what we need to do right now, especially right now. Yes. I mean, I think that there's, it's, it's when I think about my early career as a comedian, uh, like there was just, there was like, we weren't, there was no cell phone cameras. There was no YouTube. There was no even want to try to get everything you wanted out in the world in the same way there is now. And that it was pretty messy. Like, you know, like I think about my early career. And I think that there is a thing that, like, I think we, if we want stand up comedians, we do have to let them be messy. Doesn't mean, you know, they, doesn't mean they can't be given feedback. But I'm a little bit like, I think right now there's like, like with Chris Rock and Chappelle, when they go on tour, they lock people's phones up. Right. And, right. you know, the idea of like, you know, to try to prevent people from letting some of this mess get out, you know, yeah. uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the, just the inherent messiness of comedy? Well, I think, you know, with with Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock and the locking of phones, it, I think there's value to that for the sort of size that they are. Um, but it, you also run that risk of the echo chamber, of course, that you're not really getting the kind of real time uh, feedback that can be useful in perfecting the craft. I think for this reason, actually, I am really, I've been really, really interested. Um, and part of this is, you know, the pandemic and isolation <laughs> talking, but I've been really interested in a lot of these comedians on TikTok, on Twitter and things like that, where people are putting themselves out there and they are allowing the kind of, um, the, the feedback that I know I certainly wouldn't want, which is social media feedback. Like you are allowing anybody to tell you like, this is funny or you're terrible, you know, anything they want kind of anonymously, these keyboard warriors coming in and saying whatever, whatever they're thinking that of what I've witnessed from that, not from everybody, you know, some of these are just, you know, fart jokes and whatever, but for some of these TikTok comedians and Twitter comedians, what they are doing is really engaging this sort of satirical impulse as a result and trying to think about, okay, how can I, um, how can I utilize this platform? I've got, you know, 20,000 followers on Twitter or something like that. How do I utilize my 20,000 followers to really hold Donald Trump's feet to the fire or to give people this, you know, 59 second moment of really thinking critically about what the pandemic is doing to, you know, black and brown people or any of these kinds of things. So there, I understand, you know, preventing feedback initially, but I also think that there is a kind of nice challenge 
being created for some of these these comedians who are really just welcome saying all right bring it on you know let's let's see what happens let's see i'm gonna throw this out there and let's see how people respond to it yeah i think just the i was i, was, I interviewed sarah cooper recently and just to imagine mm -hmm. that like nobody could have predicted her right you know not even her <laughs> you know, like the idea of like that you know she'd been a professional comedian she'd written uh, books but then the idea of like i'm gonna go on tiktok and lip sync the president that's what the country needs right now right yeah i mean yeah she's she's such a great example of that um because yeah she'd have she had this kind of career prior but it was this particular moment and utilizing social media the way she's she's been able to use it that exploded her career. And I'm seeing that, you know, with a lot of um, a lot of people on Twitter and TikTok right now, that it's it's the sort of democratization of the field, right? That that because you are on social media, certain people have a little bit more traction and things like that, which is a it's it's kind of a cool moment. It's it almost feels like you're, you know, in a very small way like you're going to the open mic nights and getting to see these kind of up and coming comedians. And then you get to start following the careers of the people that you're interested in by literally following them on Twitter. Um, and, and so it's kind of, it's really an interesting moment to be studying comedy and to be watching these comedians work. Yeah. So there are certain tent poles in the book. I'm holding up the book again, cause it's like a talk show by the book, uh, yeah. laughing to keep from dying. Uh, but I had to read the title because I have three kids and I was like, dying, yes, not crying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pandemic brain. But um, what are the tentpole moments of it? Because I think the thing that's great is also Af calling it African-American satire, not African-American comedy, which satire is not, you can talk about that, like satire is not a, a room of the comedy house we got a lot of access to or we told we were in. Uh, but then what are the tentpole moments of that that you talk about in the book? Um, so for me, some of the some of the big moments I think um, occur at the beginning and the the end of the book, in fact. But the first one um, that really sort of helped me think about where I wanted this book to go was talking about satire in slavery, because we often think of slavery as this this sort of moment. It's I think it's very easy for us and sort of comforting to just say, oh, you know, it was a very sad time and, you know, it, but it also never would have been me because I'm too strong and like, I'm too rebellious. Like they could have never... <laughs> And it's like, but they would have, and and we need to reckon with we need to reckon with that, with with you know that reality of it. But also, even more importantly, we need to reckon with the fact that the enslaved uh, Africans were incredibly revolutionary in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is the utilization of satire. So I talk in the book um, about Jordan Anderson, who was this enslaved, formerly enslaved man. Who, um, whose former master comes and, you know, asks him to return to the plantation to work. And Anderson, you know, after emancipation, and Anderson says, I would be happy to do that if you pay me my back wages. And I, you know, calculated them out. And this is what you owe me for the past 30 years. And, you know, this is what you owe my wife also. And here are my kids. And like, if you can do this, then I could start considering returning. Mm -hmm. And it's this brilliant sort of move, not only that he writes this, but that it gets published in the paper. Like it's this sort of huge um, satirical moment. Um, and I think, you know, when we start to recognize the fact that African-American satire, that satire itself is a foundational piece of African-American history, and it's a foundational piece of our lives and livelihoods, we can really start thinking about what this cultural moment looks like and means. So when I, you know, I hear people um, sometimes say the, you know, I am not my ancestors kind of articulation. And I always think to myself, well, you know, I kind of, I want to be my ancestors. I want to be smart enough to survive. I want to be clever enough to, to um, push forward. So, so it's that idea of how what we often think of as a sort of revolutionary satirical moment of the 20, 20th and 21st century, they were doing that and doing it really, really well and, and you know, with cleverness in the, you know, 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, you know, long before us. Uh, the other point that, that was really critical to me was the, um, when, when the movie Get Out came out, um, because that to me, 
was the sort of, I think get out more than anything typifies the Trump presidency. Uh, and the reason I say that is it came out right before, or it came out right around the inauguration. Um, I remember seeing it in, um, I remember seeing the preview in the theater. And as soon as it starts, you know, you see like this, you, see, you hear that it's a Jordan Peele movie. And the, I remember that the car hits the deer and everybody laughs because they're like, haha, it's going to be a comedy of some sort. And then <laughs> it's not at all, even in the preview. And everybody just is like, oh my God, what is, what is happening? This is the same guy from Key and Peele, right? Like, why is this taking place? And the way Get Out refuses to, uh, to it, it holds our feet to the fire by not allowing racism to be something that somebody else experiences. That the family in Get Out, the white family in Get Out, the Armitage family is, you know, attractive, well-educated, Northern, you know, all of these things that we're not supposed to think of racists as being. Um, that that Jordan Peele is like, no, like let's actually critically investigate what it means when racism takes place in um, a place that's much e much less easily, you know, dismissed. I say this as somebody from North Carolina that people are always coming to me as somebody who lives in California now and saying like, oh, you must be so happy you don't live someplace where it's racist anymore. And I'm like, mm. That's not, that's not how I would describe the move from Durham, North Carolina, where there's, you know, tons of Black people and where I felt super affirmed as a Black woman to a different part of the country where that's not necessarily always the case. And I love Jordan Peele for really making us question that, making us really think about what racism looks like. So those two um, narratives that's kind of bookend this uh the book really are, are the critical points that um, sort of drove my investigation of satire. What it looked like in the beginning, um, if we started thinking about slavery, to what is happening now and what direction satire might take after this. Uh, I feel like we can't, we've talked a lot about dudes uh, <laughs> um, uh, which, but I think that like, I, so I'm thinking about like one thing the 21st century, especially the last couple of years has, there have been black women voices who have come forward. Uh, and like where I think about black lady sketch show, uh, yeah. Issa Rae, uh, and recently, and Leslie Jones is somebody who I really have followed her career quite closely. Recently, she just, she said that she sort of in promoting supermarket sweep, which is a lot of fun. My kids love it. Uh, talked about how Saturday Night Live never really was a good fit for her. Right. And as somebody who is like, feels like a historian of Saturday Night Live, I was like, I saw that coming. I was okay. hoping that it would work out. She would did a lot of great things on that show, but you could always feel like it was like not the right exact fit for her. And I think, you know, in the same way that like, sort of like, like we, in the book what you talk about, like Chappelle and Chris Rock having this moment of like, this doesn't fit the way I wanted to Chappelle with the $50 million from Comedy Central. Um, what are your thoughts on black women in comedy and satire and African American satire? I, um, I wish Black Lady Sketch Show came out earlier so that I could talk about it in this book because I absolutely plan on talking about it in the next book I write um, because I that show feels like a revelation to me. It is so... Um, smart and just thoughtful. And one of the things that it reminds me of with Leslie Jones, but also just with these kind of black satire moments with women, with uh, black female comedians, um, black female satirists right now, is that space of black friendship as life-saving and life-affirming. Even with something like Black Lady Sketch Show, the sort of overarching premise of the show is that it is four Black women together at the end of the world. Um, that these four Black women have survived the apocalypse together. The same thing that we're seeing with Insecure, that it is these four Black women who are friends and they are the heart of the show. That Issa and Molly, that relationship, that friendship is where we are supposed to derive the most joy, I think. I, I argue in the book and I will argue this, you know, forever, regardless of how the show actually ends, I believe that the relationship between Molly and Issa on Insecure is the, the that's the, the love relationship that we're supposed to root for. That's what we care about. We want to see them um, survive. And so, so what we are witnessing in this moment is this idea 
of black womanhood, black female friendships as life um, affirming, life saving. So when we think about Leslie Jones, who was there with Sashir Zameda, but you know they didn't really have a lot of sketches together that frequently, it felt so much to me like SNL did not know what to do with Leslie Jones. And she would, they just had this brilliant comedian who was squandered, you know, who just like they did, and they didn't know what to do with Sashir Zameda for that, for the, in that same way, um, that they just didn't know what to do. And it's about kind of creating your own space for yourself, finding those affirmative, those, those self-affirming spaces that Black women are crafting for themselves. And we're seeing that right now with, um, with Black, um, Black female comedy, that, that they're crafting these kind of unique spaces for themselves. I think it's time we have some Q&A from the audience. Uh, we'll open it up. I think we'll hear some questions. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. So our first question comes from Alan Blair. And he asks, in thinking about African-American satire, is the medium part of the message? If so, is there a most effective medium? Does sketch comedy have more cultural impact than stand-up, than comedy film, than a TV sitcom? This is a very good question. Um, for me, it's, it's not as much about the medium, except that um, a lot of the medium determines the audience's ability to focus. So one of the things that, that I'm really interested in right now is the way um, Chappelle, to my mind, does a lot better. Again, whether I agree with everything he says or not, he is better to me on um, in a stand-up comedy setting versus on um, Saturday Night Live, because there's a little bit more intentionality in how he's able to um, sort of approach the, the material. And there's a little bit of intentionality in the audience who's at home viewing. So some of the, the question of medium, I think, ultimately is about who is watching and under what circumstances they're able to watch it. Um, and so that for me is really, really kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, did you have something to add? I didn't know if I was supposed to answer, so I just was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, whatever you want. <laughs> so, uh, Bargelaine Armstrong asks, um, what do you think of satire in Black literature, particularly The Good Lord Bird? I have not, <laughs> I am not familiar with The Good Lord Bird um, yet, in part because I don't have showtime. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, Good answer. I, I, you don't my, all have all the channels. I, I want to be like, this might be a good time to ask my university uh, if they'd like to uh, sponsor me by getting me Showtime because I want very much to see the good Lord Bird. And I, I am hoping to um, utilize that because I have only heard really good things about the, um, the, the series and I want to do more. I, I had just um, complained on social media about a year ago about the um, sort of interest in creating um, sort of fictional white saviors and nobody was willing to touch John Brown. And then somebody was like, actually, there's a, you know, there's a series that's coming out in a few months called The Good Lord Bird. So I haven't, I'm not as familiar with that. Um, Kamau, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to see it or read it or anything. No, no, I haven't, I have not seen it yet. That's, uh, there's, there's too much TV, everybody. <laughs> and and uh, for those of us who are parenting during a pandemic, we don't have all that catching up on, on, on all the things time that some of you have. So yeah, I have not, but, but I love to be Diggs, so I'm sure it's great. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I will watch anything with Daveed Diggs, but again, I don't, I don't have showtime. I think the real takeaway here is that Santa Clara needs to pay for your expanded basic cable package. <laughs> and services so you can actually keep bringing them all this good attention instead of the negative attention that Santa Clara brings to itself sometimes. Oh. <laughs> okay so our next question is from Michelle Benzanon um, and she asks Danielle how did you move from being a fan to studying comedy and satire? Who are your mentors and inspiration? Well so that, that is a great question as well. Um, one of the things that uh, kind of sparked for me the, the 
idea that this was possible is that one of my mentors when I was in uh, my PhD program said, what would you study like a job? When I was trying to figure out what I wanted to write my dissertation on. And I was like, um, satire, I guess. Like, is that is that possible? And she was like, yeah, like, you know, write about, <laughs> write about whatever, basically. And once I started thinking about that, I was like, okay, I'm going to approach it from this very, you know, sort of scholarly distant perspective. Um, and then I engaged even more deeply and was like, no, actually, I really enjoy writing about this. I can write about it from a place of joy and love, and that's what I'm going to do. So, so thinking about what would you do, and, and I say this to my students all the time, so I'll say it here as well. What will you do? Um, what, could you, what could you study like a job? What would you do if you could write about anything? And academia um, has been a space where I've gotten to engage those kinds of um, conversations as well. So, yeah. Um, and sort of building off of that, Tara Demi asks, how does your work fit with other scholarship on Black comedians? Thinking specifically Carpio's Laughing Fit to Kill and Hagen's Laughing Mad. Um, so I think that that um, my book kind of picks up where those two books left off and is extending the work that um, Carpio and Hagen's began. Um, and I definitely cite them uh, throughout this book as sort of these critical figures along with Daryl Dixon Carr um, as somebody, as, as sort of three figures who really loom large in, in my book because they are really thinking um, about what satire looks like today and how it looked in the history in, in sort of this historical context. I'm also really interested not just in sort of traditional satire, but also the way we can read things as satire. How do you deal with the world around you when the world itself becomes sort of self-satirizing. You know, I keep thinking about the recent moment where like the lights were shut off in the White House. And I feel like if you wrote that in a satire, your editor would be like, that's a little like, you know, we get the point you're making. You don't have to beat it up in the head with it. Like you can do something more subtle, but this actually happened. So how do you create satire when the world is self-satirizing? Ask myself that question every day. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Melina Johnson, and she asks, as Black people continue to use humor to survive, how do we make it clear to non-Black people that we're not moving on or making light of or forgiving serious issues and the use of that humor? That's a, that's a good question, too. Um, I think that a lot of that has to do with um, being very specific about who the target of the joke is, um, that, that you can make it clear that there's a sense of accountability um, in the humor itself that that you are you don't that, that you are thinking about um, what the laughter how the laughter matters because you were talking about a specific facet of um, of the world that you know and, and your position in it that it's not just about sort of, laughter as its own sort of thing that, that doesn't come from anywhere, that, that a lot of it has to do with the way laughter, um, that, it, that it matters, that we have to think about um, our laughter as being inspired by something, uh, uh, that it's not just jokes, that nothing is just jokes. We're laughing because, you know, our expectations are unmet or they're met in a peculiar way or whatever the case may be, but making that clear and kind of going back once the laughter begins and saying, okay, what was, why did this make you laugh? What was the reason behind it? Let's think about what the rest, what this says about our place in the world. That's the way that you can kind of avoid that slip where people say, oh, it's just comedy. It's just jokes. It doesn't matter. I would say it absolutely matters. It matters a lot. Okay, so the next question, we're going back to Jordan Peele. So Amy Luck asks, it seems like Us extends the project of Get Out in really interesting ways, but wasn't as well received. Do you think that has anything to do with the changed expectations around Peele's work and its relation to horror versus satire? Mm -hmm. Um, I think yes, and I, I, I think that, that people, Get Out is such a sort of 
overt, it's overtly horror and it is overtly satiric. Um, so there was a sort of buy-in and we were also kind of surprised and on the edge of our seat about the, um, about what um, Peel was doing. And it was so clearly about race. I would make the argument that Get Out is also, or excuse me, that Us is also very much about race. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this uh, for a very long time at another, <laughs> at another time, that Get Out, that Us is also very much about race, but in much more subtle ways. Um, that I, I read Us as having something to do with sort of aspirational Blackness and the way um, the family, the Wilson family, in us, despite trying to always kind of position themselves as having, um, you know, wealth and being affluent and being, you know, respectable, they never can quite make it up to the uh, level of their neighbors, Kitty and Josh, right? That they're never quite, their house isn't quite as nice. Um, Gabe doesn't have quite as nice a boat, all of these kinds of things. But it's harder to read that. And I think people wanted some, or people imagined that because Peel did this one thing that he should always do something very overt. I am personally really excited uh, by both Get Out and Us. And I'm really interested in seeing what, what Jordan Peel is going to do next as a result. But I think that, that people wanted to read sort of a more overt um, racialized context for that movie. And since it doesn't provide it, people were like, well, this isn't what Jordan Peele does, even though he'd literally only made one movie prior. They were like, this is so out of step with, with what his films look like. But we don't, we don't know yet what Jordan Peele's films look like because he hasn't made that many. Okay, so our next question comes from Malachi Finn. And they ask, what is a prominent theme throughout your book that you would like readers to contemplate further and potentially research on their own? Ooh, I like that question. Um, homework. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is, a, this is a good question for, for I might uh, try and figure out how to give it to my students at some point. Um, one of the themes that, that I think uh, people can research a little bit more is that um, idea of where the line between um, the funny and not funny is in satire. Like what makes something overtly satirical and what does it mean if we um, are still, what does it mean to look at satires that are specifically not funny? Um, because when we're thinking about the context of comedy, there's also all of this satire that is intentionally supposed to make us feel really, really kind of uh, uncomfortable. So what does it mean in the 21st century if some satirists are saying, you know what, I don't really want to do comedy anymore. I want to think instead about what's the most horrifying thing that I can do or what's the most unsettling thing I can do. Why is that useful perhaps in the 21st century? What is it about writing comedy in the Trump era that may or may not require us to stop laughing for a second? Okay, so the next question is from Amanda Edwards and she asks, in your classes, have you found a way to use black satire to help white students recognize things like white privilege, perhaps things that open up a dialogue and help white students to better recognize black centered issues? I just want to step in for a second. I pretty much think you think that's your job, right? <laughs> it honestly, it, it yeah, yeah. The, the answer is yes. Um, and I would say that, you know, a lot of the class um, talks about, a lot of my African-American comedy class is, is um, interested in the question of white privilege and how these comedians are, um, responding to it. One of the things that we talk about a lot is the fact that, you know, we are all raised in a sort of in, in under a white supremacist system, right? And so we recognize white supremacy as e whether we want to sort of acknowledge that it's real, we know it's there. This is how we understand ourselves and the world around us. That is important for um, students of color to recognize, but many of them come in already understanding that. Uh, not every white student comes in feeling comfortable talking about that because they're worried that it's going to mean something, that they are a bad person. So thinking about what it means to be critical of white supremacy, 
What does it mean to be critical of white privilege uh, without that necessarily talking about good or bad white people are getting into this, you know, kind of I'm, but I always, you know, I was always good to you people kind of <laughs> rhetoric about things, how we can actually talk about systems of power um, and how many comedians are in fact talking about systems of power. Jordan Peele, you know, to go back since, you know, we've talked about Get Out and Us um, a bit today, Jordan Peele in Get Out is not, the Armitage family is not supposed to be villainous by themselves. They are endemic to white, you know, to white privilege, to white supremacy. And that I think is the critical difference. Okay, so our next question, um, we're going back to TikTok. This was from Karitha Mitchell. And she says, Danielle, can you link your interest in TikTok comedians to your analysis of satire? You seem impressed with the feedback they're opening themselves up to. Is that linked to how you understand Black satire and its cultural work? Oh, that's a great question. I keep saying that's a great question, but all of these questions are so fantastic. Um, <laughs> I really like this one. Um, yes, I think that um, it, it is the idea of satire as a space as a space for growth and the idea of satire as requiring yourself to get outside of your echo chamber to open yourself up to feedback even if it's negative um, because it might create a sharper and more precise satirical move that a lot of these TikTok comedians um, are doing what you know, I'm sort of advocating for throughout the book, which is really thinking critically about who is listening to the satire and how that that satirist might understand uh, how the how that audience member might understand themselves being um, depicted through the satire. And so, so within the context of TikTok and all of these kinds of things, the fact that people are opening themselves up is. Um, is hugely important. And especially because on social media, it allows a wider entry point that it's not just people who have the money to go and see Dave Chappelle. It's not just people who have a babysitter on Saturday night, you know, that, that it's anybody that I am, like, I am always like, you know, taking a break from doom scrolling on Twitter to look at some of these comedians, like, wow, my kids are asleep, like with my headphones in, like trying to watch these, like snickering in a corner someplace quietly, trying not to wake anybody up. But I wouldn't be able to do that um, if I had to all, you know, I still love going to comedy shows and things like that. But this gives a wider point of entry, a wider point in sort of thinking about, okay, what is the kind of cultural move that these comedians want to make right now? Okay, it looks like we have time for a couple more. Um, and this next question is from Marilyn Edelstein. And she asks, do you see major generational changes in the reception of black comedy in general or satire in particular? Um, differences between how you, knew, you and your students view black satire or how you and your parents do? Um, I think this is, this is a sort of tricky question um, because the answer is yes and no. Um, Yes, I see some differences, sort of what Kamal, you and I were talking about, about how looking back, you know, 30 years, it's much easier to say like, oh, that was very offensive or that's really problematic and we don't, you know, do that. Where people 30 or 40 years ago may not have had the language to really understand why they felt uncomfortable with certain things. We've got, we have a different language now. Um, and I think that that is important in the conversations about satire as they are emerging generationally. Um, but I think that also my research in satire is really founded on this idea that, that it's kind of that um, repeating and rhyming nature of what satire, what African-American satire does, that this satiric impulse has gotten more overt certainly in the 21st century when compared to slavery or when compared to the you know sort of satiric moves people may have made on the minstrel stage for good reason for clear reason but that a lot of that is still it's still the same I think the same sort of audiences are hungry for satire and hungry to see themselves represented in a in um a way in a way that makes sense, that's not just sort of the identity that the mainstream media presumes you should have, that these are black comedians, black satirists who are defining themselves for themselves 
And we've always wanted that within the context of Black communities. Okay, so it looks like we have time for just one more. Um, Jasmine May asks, as a Black Latina, how do you envision fellow Afro-Latinx and other Latinos engaging Black satire of today and the future? And what examples of past inspiration into Black comedic art crossing over into Latinx comedy should we study? Um, this is a little bit of a, a tricky question um, because I think that, you know, for me, um, I would say that, that there has always been sort of within the context of comedy, uh, there has always been sort of a fluidity there um, similar to uh, what we've experienced with hip hop in its origins that Black communities, Latinx communities, and sort of this merger in between both of them. And so I think that the roots uh, are sort of similarly structured there, that, that we are seeing a sort of ebb and flow um, and a creative sort of um, response that a lot of um, people are engaging in sort of Black cultural practices who are not necessarily, um, you know, who, who may or may not identify as Black necessarily as well. Um, and so it's the way, um, for me, Black Af African-American satire is founded on um, these kinds of, the sort of Black interior space and the way that opens up and uh, that, that that becomes more of the productive space uh, trying to think how best to say this, that that becomes the more productive space, um, Black interiority, the way people are defining themselves within the context of Blackness, um, that that's how you sort of define the ways that, that African-American satire is uh, evolving throughout time. And it's similar, again, that, that same connection that you can almost see the way hip hop has sort of emerged and engulfed in, in flow, it flows through different cultural experiences. Yeah. All right, it looks like we're all out of time. Do you guys have any final thoughts for us? Buy the book, everybody. Buy the book right here. Go to the collective in Oakland, laughing to keep from dying. Buy the book. That's my final thought. Yeah. <laughs> And I just want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Kamal, for um, being in conversation with me today and for everything that you said um, it th throughout this event as well. But this, this was great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hopefully see you in 2021, 2022. Yeah, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you both so much. Everyone have a great night.